Welcome back, fellow true crime enthusiasts, to today's case file, part three of the series, Who Murdered Jimmy Gall? The Manuscript, Memories of the Little House. Welcome to Body of Crime, your go-to true crime podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the gripping world of criminal mysteries. Join your hosts, Jose Medina, Crystal Garcia, and Alicia Anaya, as we deliver the full stories immersing you in the heart of each case. With spine-chilling cases, in-depth analysis, captivating interviews, and a comprehensive examination of the evidence, embark on a thrilling journey with us as we explore bone-chilling cases from around the globe. Whether you're a seasoned true crime enthusiast or a fresh face in the genre, we guarantee to keep you on the edge of your seat. So put on your detective hat, grab your notepad, and get ready to dive into the thrilling world of body of crime. In our last installment of the series, The Investigation, we took you back to the initial investigation that was carried out by the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, led by the infamous Sheriff Mr. Lee, as he deployed all resources to investigating the brutal murder and assault of Jimmy Gall in May of 1964. As investigators scrambled to conduct interviews, question witnesses, and identify persons of interest, the perpetrator seemed to disappear without a trace, leaving no clues behind and no evidence of who he or she might be, leading to speculation and rumors amongst the community that question the potential of the very neighbors that populated the otherwise calm and happy neighborhood of Citrus Heights, California. It was obvious things had changed as kids no longer played as freely as before. Most walked in groups to school and parents became concerned when the children stayed out longer than normal. As leads ran dry, the case began losing steam and eventually resources were diverted, leaving poor Jimmy's death unsolved and cold. But brace yourselves because we're just scratching the surface. Today, you will learn of the pivotal moment that reignited a quest for truth decades after the tragic death of seven-year-old Jimmy Gall. What began as an unexpected visit from a group of strangers in May of 2003 39 years after the murder of young Jimmy, an equally unexpected manuscript would land on the doorstep of the Ferris family in Citrus Heights, California. The author, none other than Lori Nelson, the sister of the last boy in Citrus Heights to see Jimmy before he was murdered. The manuscript delivered to Lori's childhood home where the Ferris family now resided. Imagine learning about an unsolved murder that happened almost 40 years ago and then learning that the murder might have occurred near your home, maybe even in your home. The document detailed the unsolved murder and maybe even implicated a member of the author's own family. It was something that the receiver of the document, Tracy Ferris, could not allow to be blown off as inconsequential. Her gut told her that the manuscript was important to the case, and without hesitation, she delivered the mysterious manuscript to the sheriff's office for investigation, hoping that it would reignite the cold case and bring answers to the decade-old mystery. Mysteriously, the sender of the document disappeared into thin air, and letters and phone calls for clarification went unanswered, even years later. If this manuscript had made it to your home, how would you have handled things? As we embark on this journey, we urge you to keep an open mind. The author of this manuscript was just nine years old when the heinous crime occurred with siblings aged eight, six, and one. If the author's claims of childhood trauma hold true, it sheds light on the profound impact trauma can have on memory formation, fragmented recollections, inaccuracies, missing pieces, distorted time perception, and memory reconstruction. So, who's ready to learn of the secrets contained within the manuscript? When Lori Nelson had mysteriously shown up at Tracy Ferris's home in May of 2003, Tracy had graciously allowed Lori and her small group of supporters to tour her new home. 
She had lived there for a little over a year, but Lori had lived there in 1964, and the home had changed a lot over the years. The fireplace was gone. Trees that held special sentiment to Lori had been uprooted, much like her family had been all those years ago, but she could still see them in her memories. Lori had come with the hopes that the visit might ignite some repressed memories of Jimmy Gall's murder, a traumatic memory that still clung to her, but she hid her intentions from Tracy, the new homeowner, at the advice of her friends who were on this visit with her. It was an important aspect of their trip, and they were very appreciative for the opportunity and for Tracy's kindness, allowing them into and around her home. The visit was filled with nostalgic discussion and ended with Lori promising to send Tracy photos of the visit. Keep in mind, this was before the proliferation of digital cameras and instant perfect photographs and selfies. The promise of printed photos from Lori disappeared from Tracy's thoughts over time, and soon she forgot about the mysterious visit as life went on, and she continued raising her growing family in the house in Citrus Heights, very close to where Jimmy had died. What Tracy did not know is that those seemingly innocuous photographs would soon pale in comparison to what arrived in her mailbox almost two years later in 2005. A manuscript titled Memories of the Little House, What Secrets Lay Within Its Pages, and how would it alter Tracy's perception of her own life, her new home, and the little boy who was murdered so very close by. I was home alone. My son, who was one years old at the time, they just knocked on the door. I see four strangers standing there. One of the women introduced herself to me as a child resident that was living in the house some 40 years ago. And she was just kind of hoping that she could be invited in and check out what it was like now. And, you know, I was a little stunned, but I also admired her, you know, for her boldness to ask for that. Because, quite frankly, if my parents ever move out of my childhood home, I think I may have wanted that experience, too. Of course, I had no idea her real motive on why she was there. The two couples came inside and they toured the ground, like the outside um, in the backyard. And the woman that lived there, she, you know, pointed, oh, we, you know, we used to play in the tree that was right here. And, you know, there was no fence back here. And, you know, she kind of walked me through what she remembered. And then she was in, you know, in the house and just kind of pointing out, you know, oh, there used to be a fireplace here. And, and we talked about that. It's a cookie cutter neighborhood. You know, everybody's house pretty much looks the same. It's just right. facing a different direction. And so I had been in many homes that she was describing that looked just like that. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. When she was there, she was taking photographs and told me that would photograph after she printed them, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't instant, you know, you couldn't just send something through a smartphone. And so I was like, you know, that's nice, you know, okay, you don't have to, but she's like, oh no, I want to. And, and that was pretty much the conversation that I had with her while she was there. But one of the things that stands out to me a lot was, is that uh, the other female in the other couple she was really adamant about making sure that I knew how much this meant to her to come into this house and that it was part of the reason on why they were even visiting. They were from out of state and they came to visit and this was high on her agenda to get to this house and have this time. I remember that was really important for her to thank me for that. She never mentioned to me at all the real motive as to why she was there. You know, I was a new homeowner, brand new mother, kind of lonely, I guess, in the house, you know, sure, you know, mm -hmm. conversation and also very proud. I only lived in the house for a little over a year and I was excited that somebody wanted to uh, come in and see what we had done. So I didn't have a problem with it and I never questioned a motive. You know, when I did get the manuscript, which was many months later, you know, I was totally shocked. I was shocked that she shared so many intimate details about her family's history prior to living in the house. I was also shocked to find out that she'd only lived in the house for about a year and a half. Based on her behavior when she was there, it felt like she lived there for 10 years at least. So I was a little confused by that. I was absolutely taken aback by the fact that a little boy had died that broke my heart, of course. And then the implications of a family member just sent me into a tailspin, thinking perhaps this child was killed in my house. 
so my emotions were just all over the place. Um, I also felt like maybe I had the key to solving a 40-year-old case. I did everything that I could to get that to the proper hands. I did that. I, you know, ran down to the local Kinko's and I made an exact replica of this manuscript. And I should probably tell you that this manuscript is not just a piece of paper. I mean, it's very detailed. It's binded. It's got photographs and side-by-side photographs and newspaper clippings. And it's even got photographs of her and her, her extracurricular activities. It outlines photographs of her siblings and her mother and the names of the kids that lived in the neighborhood at the time. It's very, very detailed manuscript. As years went by, you know, I did, I kind of felt a little bit betrayed by those strangers. Why didn't you just tell me your real motive? I don't understand. Now, I guess I'm not walking in their shoes, so I really don't know if that was something that I would have wanted to know or if I would have wanted to share Maybe I would have not let them in with their fear if they told me the real reason they were there. But I did feel betrayed by them after I got this manuscript. But I also felt like she was crying out for help because in this manuscript, she tells me to do whatever you want with this information. I remember getting the mail. Our mailbox was a mailbox that was attached to the house and it was a big brown envelope and it was protruding out of the mailbox because it was just one of those ones that's on the house that's kind of... It's not very big. And I was climbing into my car and I was like, oh, and it was fairly close to the street. So I always, when I saw something, I always grabbed it. I didn't leave it when I was leaving the house. And I went and grabbed it and I realized it was from her. And I remember opening it up and seeing, you know, the cover. It had a cover page and it was, you know, and I was like, what is this? And I remember coming through it and seeing what I recall standing out was all these newspaper clippings because there's like four or five pages of them. I'm like, why is she sending me this? And I was a little thrown back. And so I did read just enough of those newspaper clippings to go, this is something I'm going to want to read cover to cover. I did not read it right there in the driveway. I was on my way out, but I did come home that day. It was one of the first things that I did as soon as I had a minute and I couldn't set it down. And I must have read it a dozen times in a a one or two day period of time and then took it to my husband and said, you wouldn't believe this. And he wasn't home when they visited. So he was totally flabbergasted. And I said, I think I have to take this to the sheriff's department. So that's what I did. It was a difficult read going to say that it was easy. It was a difficult read. I had a lot of emotions go through my my mind. I thought, you know, this poor little boy, this poor family, you know, she shares, you know, intimate details of her life. And I felt bad for her and I felt bad for the little boy. I felt bad for the family. I felt bad for, you know, she goes on to share in this manuscript how the community came together to try and find him. And I felt bad for all of the children affected because they lived in the neighborhood. And, right. and I felt safe in that neighborhood. And that changed after I read this. I no longer felt as safe as I did. I was raising children in this house. As Tracy worked to digest the contents of the manuscript, reading through newspaper clippings of Jimmy Gall's death, intermingled with the ruminations of Lori's memories and childhood photos, Tracy delivered the manuscript to the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. So I felt empowered with information. In my mind, I thought it was going to solve the case. She expected swift action and for Jimmy's case to be reignited with what she felt were new leads. As Tracy attempted to follow up with the hopes that this cold, unsolved case would indeed be solved and closed, she found little had been done by detectives. It seemed that there was no movement in the case from her perspective, and she soon became frustrated with the local authorities for their lack of action and follow-up. I was disappointed in how they responded to it. Because like I said before, in my mind, I was holding a piece of evidence that was going to catapult them into oh my gosh this is the killer and we're going to be able to solve this 
Oh, thank you so much for turning it over. I didn't get anything like that. I just got, oh, okay, well, here's an address. Just put it in the mail. There was no follow-up, and so I followed up and said, hey, did you receive it? Oh, yeah, we got it. Thank you for your service. Well, <laughs> are you guys going to follow up? No, we're not allowed to talk to you about that. It was very anticlimactic. Periodically, Tracy found herself wondering what was happening with Jimmy's case, and they often referenced Jimmy around their home. So we lived in that house for 20 years after I turned it over. I always felt after getting this that he was a part of that house. In the manuscript, Lori mentioned that her sister at one point had attempted to contact the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department to speak to detectives about their revelation sometime around April of 1992, about 11 years before the mysterious visit from Lori and 13 years before the arrival of the manuscript. And the detectives at the time expressed interest in interviewing the Nelsons, but never followed up and never interviewed them for one reason or another. Before we talk about the importance of kind of how the manuscript came into all of this and how the manuscript's been a catalyst to, you know, reigniting Jimmy's case, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that when you deliver something to law enforcement, especially if you're not part of the case, they don't have a requirement to update you. And in a lot of cases, they're unable to for various reasons or another, whether that's maybe the, the person's information that, that you've given them, um, their personal information in their family, um, details of the case that they can't have getting out. So there's different reasons as to why Tracy could have felt like the police weren't doing what maybe she thought they should have been doing. And that's understandable. So I can understand why Tracy would have started feeling like, man, I feel like I gave them this, you know, all this information and they're not this doing anything gold with mine it. of information. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. What, what are they doing? So I can understand that frustration, you know, it's a big thing to have on your plate and to feel like you're holding and then to not have any answers. Yeah. Let's take a step back and let's talk about the visit and how strange that would be to be a new homeowner and then have someone mysteriously show up at your house and say, hey, we want to come in and look around and we want to, you know, we want to tour your home because I lived here as a little girl. Has that ever happened to you? (laughs) <laughs> and if that did happen, like, how would you process that? Honestly, I wouldn't let somebody come in my house and around my house and, and take photos, especially if they came in a large group and I was by myself with my child. Yeah. That's a personal thing. And that's just based on my experience and my knowledge of people's motives and just the vulnerability of allowing somebody to come into my house and then do something. So I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but to be taking pictures of like, your home as it is in that time, that's a little invasive. Yeah. Yeah. But the grace of Tracy to allow her to do that, that was very selfless. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Very selfless. And it obviously meant a lot to Lori and and the people that she came with. And for some reason to me, it seems like she felt like she bonded with Tracy in that experience as they both lived in that home. And I think that's kind of what led to the future communication that came through the manuscript because the manuscript really is written as if it's written to Tracy. It is. There's multiple references and we'll talk about that later, but there's multiple references where you can tell that it's definitely written for Tracy. And that's really important to know because when you think of a manuscript, you think like maybe it's just a narrative, but it's really written almost like a letter to Tracy saying, Hey, when I was in your home, you know, and and again, we'll get into the details later, but it it really does read as if it's a note to Tracy. Right. But at the time, they didn't share their real motive for being there and the fact that there was a death associated with that visit. And now where I can sympathize with Lori or understand Lori is that if I was coming to your home and wanted to do that for whatever the reason was, I wouldn't tell you that. And not that I'm trying to be deceptive with you, but I know personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable if somebody said, hey, somebody was murdered in your backyard. Let me come around and look like I used to live here. That would make me uncomfortable. So 
I wouldn't want to do that to somebody. Plus, if I need this experience, I'm going to be worried that that's going to turn you off. That's going to shut you down. Sure. The other piece of it to me is that Lori was looking for some type of trigger to bring back some type of repressed memories. So I, I really feel like the reason for her being there was to help the case. She was trying to do something that would help the case. And maybe she could remember something that happened that she had long ago repressed. It's not the first time that her and her family members had tried to retract repressed memories right. from that time period. And you know, especially now there's a lot of, you know, you can go on TikTok and see a lot of things about people talking about healing their inner child. And when you've experienced traumatic events, it's important to, especially during this time frame, a lot of times families taught their kids to kind of push things down, act like yeah. they didn't exist. You know, we don't talk about that. We don't, yeah. you know, let's never bring that up again. And so part of confronting those things from your past is to face them. And because the human brain is so intelligent and it tries to protect us from trauma when it experiences trauma, a lot of times we'll have these gaps or these kind of morphs of what really occurred. And it's helpful to place yourself in environments that can trigger a memory. Right. And actually, this is very similar, believe it or not, to post-traumatic stress disorder for people. So when you've encountered something that created that PTSD, there are certain things without your knowledge that something will happen and it will trigger you in a manner where maybe you start having flashbacks of the event that occurred. And so it's almost like purposefully trying to put yourself in that moment to be triggered so that you can get those memories so that you can fill some gaps so that you can heal. That's a method that's used. It's a method that's used actually for PTSD in a therapeutic setting as well to try to get you to face things in order to progress and heal. It takes Lori about two years to gather all her notes and all her photos that she took and, and to build this manuscript before she sends it to Tracy. And when Tracy gets it, Tracy's forgotten about that visit two years ago. Tracy has moved on with her life. She's forgotten that group of people that came through her house. And all of a sudden, here's this package in the mail. And when she opens it up, she's surprised to find that it's from Lori. I would think it would be kind of cool. Like, this is my new house. My house has a history. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool to know. I'd be a little, you know, intrigued. That'd be kind of cool for somebody to share their their story about their time in the home. That, that'd actually be kind of cool. It would be a little bit intriguing to me. I don't think Tracy really expected to receive anything from Lori. You know, Lori saying, oh, I'll print pictures and I'll mail them to you. You know, sometimes people say that stuff and then they don't follow through. Out of kindness. Right. Yeah. And like, not a big deal. You know, like, okay, I didn't, you know, nice thought, but, you sure. know, I didn't really expect to receive them. I don't think that Tracy was really expecting to receive pictures or whatever that Lori was going to send her. And I definitely don't think she was expecting to receive what she did. And now when she dropped the big news about Jimmy, now that changed things for Tracy. Her experience at that moment changed in her home with her family. Like this was impactful. And, you know, sometimes we don't realize what we're doing to others when we do it. And there's a little bit of, of accountability on both ends because you choose to respond in a way in how you perceive something, how you address what it is that you've encountered. And the person who is initiating that as well has a certain sense of some type of accountability as well, what they're doing. And when I say what they're doing, not necessarily how you respond, but the fact that you can respond. And so if they're initiating something, there is a certain level of accountability of this person over here that I don't know, especially, can respond a number of different ways. And so there's a certain level of accountability on that end. Tracy reads the manuscript multiple times. She can't believe it. It's mind boggling to her, the manuscript. And in her interpretation of the manuscript, it feels to her like there's an implication in there of almost an admission or almost an accusation. And she feels like this is something important to the case that needs to be taken to the police. She takes the manuscript to the sheriff's office and she hands it over to the sheriff. I probably would have done the same thing. 
it's something that tells the story of something that happened a long time ago that you don't know if the police have that have it or not. It's something new. I probably would have done the same thing. And I think where things probably would have differed between what Tracy did and what I would have done, you know, given my experience and given, given my personality, I probably would have let it go at that. I probably wouldn't even gave him a copy. I probably would have gave him the original file and I would have said, okay, this is now I've passed the baton and now this is your responsibility. Not it. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, but Tracy didn't do that. Tracy didn't do that. She held on to the original. She gave the police a copy and she remained an active participant in the investigation of this case. She didn't just hand it off and say, it's not my problem anymore, which is different than what most people would probably do. And that's probably very true. Because most people don't want to be pulled into something, you know, it's massive. And again, with the accountability, you're placing something in somebody's lap, in essence, and walking away. And that's dangerous. (laughs) No matter what your intentions were, that's a dangerous thing to do, especially with somebody that you don't know, you know, that you really don't know. And I think, you know, like you said, I, I think that Lori felt a certain type of way when Tracy allowed for her to come into her home and look around on the inside and outside, take photos. I think she felt a certain level of connection and trust there in sharing these things with her. And so to me, before we get into the details of the manuscript, I believe I would have contacted the person right away. And I would have said, hey, Lori, I'm a little bit confused by this. Like, I appreciate that you sent this to me and I I love learning about the history of my home in the neighborhood, but this is kind of sounding to me like you're implicating a family member. As, am I interpreting this right? And then I would gauge how that conversation was before I went and delivered it to law enforcement. And now that's me. Right. And the reason I say that's me is because of my experience and my education. And I would want to give that person the benefit of the doubt of, because of the way it's written, it is confusing. And I can see why, somebody would want to go to the police. And I also can see why you could be nervous to reach out to the person. Sure. And say, hey, are you saying, you know, are you implicating somebody? There could be a certain level of fear there. Yeah, you know, 100%. So. Tracy doesn't experience a lot of traction with the authorities. She doesn't get any feedback. And at some point, the manuscript goes into a box and it goes into storage and it sits in a box for a long time. I would have to go back and reference the date, but I know that Tracy had a conversation with the sheriff's department where they basically told her, we can't give you any information. We can tell you that anything that we are supposed to do, we could do, we should do, we ethically are responsible to do, we have done, are doing, or will do, is basically kind of the roundabout way that they kind of told her that they addressed it. So, but obviously they can't share with her any of the details because she's not part of the case. Right. And they did tell her that, yeah. you know, that's the extent of what we can tell you. And, and that's fair. That's, you know, that's makes sense, right? That, right? That's logical. But how frustrating is that to have a big piece of the pie and to think you have a big piece of the pie and then to not know what's happening with it. Like that's gotta be like that. That would drive me insane. But you know, the unfortunate thing is that that's what families experience. Yeah. Throughout this process, because I can tell you, we work with a lot of different victims, families and survivors, and there is a significant amount of information that is not shared with them right throughout that process. And it is extremely frustrating because imagine having your family member where something's occurred and you're trying to get updates. Hey, where are you guys at? Do you have any suspects? Do you and you can't get the answers that you want? In 2022, 58 years after Jimmy's murder, Tracy found herself in a discussion with her son about the case, expressing her frustration with the lack of activity to solve the cold case. He recommended that she use the power of social media to gain exposure and traction on the case, something that Tracy up to that point had not considered. Locating the manuscript, which Tracy had managed to keep over the last 17 years, she posted about the manuscript in the Facebook community Crime Watch group. I decided to take it to social media because my youngest son, after we moved out of that house, was sitting in front of the television watching a YouTube channel about going into haunted homes and and trying to talk to ghosts. And I was like, what are you watching? And he was like, I don't know, but it's interesting. So then he brought up Jimmy. 
wants to go. And he goes, well, tell me now, now that I'm 18, mom, tell me. And I said, all right. So I happened to have been doing some unpacking and I knew that I had put that manuscript away in this closet. So I just went and grabbed it. And I said, if you want to know about Jimmy, you just read this. And you know, an 18 year old boy doesn't want to read a manuscript. And so I told him, and he said, Mom, did you put that on social media? You know, there's people out there that have podcasts and they go after trying to solve cases. And and I started laughing and I said, you know what, honey, 20 years ago, they didn't have social media. And he <laughs> said, well, well, what's stopping you now? And I said, well, I don't know. That's a really good question. And it wasn't a question that I took lightly. I sat with that for a while. And then I just finally, one night, I was like, you know what? It's just going to remain hidden in my closet if I don't do something. And I couldn't let that be. I had to do something because it has been with me for 20 plus years. Through social media, the Citrus Heights Sentinel became interested in Jimmy's case and made the decision to run a story entitled Cold Case, Renewed Interest Arises in Unsolved Murder of Citrus Heights Boy. The article would be published on November 19th of 2022. The story covered Lori Nelson's visit to the Ferris home in May of 2003 and told about how Tracy came into receipt of the manuscript in 2005. The story alluded to the possibility of the manuscript implicating a suspect in the crime. The story of Jimmy Gall resonated with anyone who heard or learned about the tragedy, but none like Karen Lalonde a retired educator who felt compelled to reach out to Tracy and offer her assistance to help further the investigation of Jimmy's death after learning about the case on social media. So when this came up and I thought, I thought, wow, this is kind of interesting. I saw that she had given an interview to the Sacramento TV station. So I watched that and I thought, wow, she thinks she has a manuscript here and the author of it has name somebody in the family that she thinks might be responsible. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, they probably have evidence and evidence box and they can pull out his clothing or something from that and send it out to be analyzed. And, you know, hey, maybe we're good to go on this. Maybe she has something because it, it will tie together with what the author of the manuscript said. I contacted her and I asked her if I could message her with a few questions, Tracy Harrison. She said, sure, and I did. And, you know, we um, started messaging, and pretty soon, you know, she said, well, let's talk on the phone, and we did. And pretty soon it was like, well, hey, you know, you want to kind of team up together on this? And, you know, she had told me that she works all day. I'm retired. And I said, well, yeah, I would be interested in doing that. So she allowed me to read the manuscript, and... um we kind of went from there. We, we just kind of formed a plan on what do you do first? Because she said, well, I want to know what to do first. And I said, well, I, I think our starting point should be trying to locate the kids that grew up in the neighborhood who are now 60 plus year old adults. That's what I started working on. And it, it was a tremendous amount of work. Tracy welcomed the assistance and was happy to have someone who could help her move the case forward. As Karen began to investigate, Lori seemed to be not just elusive to the Fairs family, who had graciously opened their home to her visit in 2003, and Karen, who was volunteering hours to investigate and shed light on the case, but she was also elusive to the very community she claimed to have belonged to, with no corroboration of any of the things she had written, leaving certain statements vague and unconfirmed. I mean, I had to pull 1964 city directories, and from that, I located names, usually it was a husband and wife's name, of who owned the property or lived at the property. And then from there, I had to try and find their kids. So, I mean, I used a lot of different means. Skepticism began to build as the pieces of the puzzle began to come together little by little. Did Lori manifest a story of her childhood from a mix of fantasy and memory, and the manuscript just a fictional story with real characters? Or were her memories a convoluted mix of truth and conjecture, where she genuinely believed what she had written to be true and factual? Could she be confronting repressed memories? Or was she experiencing the effects on the brain linked to trauma? Trauma that she alluded to in the pages of the manuscript. On July 7, 2023, 
CBS News aired the story entitled, Advocates Demand Justice of Jimmy Gall, Seven-Year-Old Boy Found Murdered in Field. The piece covered the call for justice led by Tracy and Karen, along with neighbors Don and Bobby Shepard and Gay Harvey. After speaking with members of the Gall family and ultimately Mrs. Dolores Michaels, Jimmy's own mother, Karen became even more committed in bringing closure to the case and justice for the Gall family. Tracy and Karen continued their attempts to reach Lori with questions concerning the manuscript, but calls and later handwritten letters went ignored. After learning a lot about the kids in the neighborhood, we had made contact with the deceased family. We had talked to several of the children that lived in the neighborhood. We had uh, reached out to people in the manuscript that she claimed she knew, that her mother knew, who was involved with the search, who came to the door and told them. Um, We were able to reach majority of those people and not a single one of them could claim to remember this family. And that's when I started questioning the manuscript. Wondering, what in the world did this woman drop in my lap? Is it just a book of lies? Like, what is going on here? We started researching the censuses, and we had trouble even finding proof that she even lived in the house. But I had photographs of her that she sent to me that are of her and her siblings and her mother in my house. I knew it was my house because I could tell it was the house. And if it wasn't the house, then it was definitely the yard because she sent me pictures of the front yard. She sent me pictures of the trees. And those trees were still there when we moved in. They were just much bigger. So I I had conflicting feelings because I'm like, nobody can recall this family. We can't find proof that they really lived there, but I've got these pictures and I've got this manuscript. She claims that she was best friends with one and that specific best friend that's been claimed in this manuscript tells us that I don't remember this person. I started to feel some resentment towards her and I was questioning the manuscript and her motive. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and send a follow-up letter and I'm just going to ask her point blank, please get a hold of me. I've got some questions. We've done some research and I need some answers. But she never responded to that either. And to be honest with you, because of her lack of reaching out to me, I feel like she doesn't care what I do anymore. I don't feel inclined to protect her anymore. If you really wanted me to protect you, you would have thanked me or acknowledged it or something. And I just don't feel like I need to carry that part of the burden anymore. So this for me is no longer about her and her manuscript. This is about finding justice for Jimmy. And it was, it was always about finding justice for Jimmy, don't get me wrong. But there was that other layer for me. I felt like she trusted me with this manuscript, and I didn't want to break that trust. But because the trust was accidentally broken, and I acknowledged that in a letter, and then I asked her to please get a hold of me because I had questions, I just felt like if I would have been her and I drop that bomb on somebody and they ask me for clarity, I think I would respect them enough to give them the clarity they were asking for. Sure. And I don't feel like she's done that for me. So I no longer feel like I want to even continue to feel obligated to protect her in any way. So I'm ready now to surrender that part of the mystery. If you don't yeah. want no part of this, then fine. I'm not going to chase you anymore, but I'm also not going to protect you anymore. I mean, I, for 20 years, believed that this person killed him and in my house. I no longer believe that he was killed in my house. I believe that he was not killed in my house. After, you know, working with Karen and even the short time that I've worked with Crystal, I no longer believe that even her 
he's still for me you know I still kind of want to know why she went that road and I still have a couple of little questions but based on what Karen and Crystal have shared and the things that they've discovered I no longer see him as my prime suspect and it's not like she just dropped it on my shoulders I mean my husband's yeah. been curious for 20 years we had ghost Jimmy in our house right so my <laughs> children you know whether they realized it or not were affected when we would go to the park and we would see his memorial they knew that that was from the little boy that was killed in our backyard so it's not like she just affected me she affected my family People are going to want to understand why this manuscript would be taken to social media. So you're talking about a case that occurred years ago. And when you try to Google the case, there's no podcasts. There's no news stories other than the one, you know, newspaper article, which before that there it was really wasn't, you know, you could hardly find any articles on the murder itself. So Tracy was thinking, Obviously, the sheriff's department must be stuck and they need some leads and I'm going to help get those leads. Right. And so by taking my son's advice, which was phenomenal advice, you know, from him, hey, mom, get on social media and share this. So that's what she did. And then, you know, I feel like people who help move the case forward come into that case by design. I feel like it was no coincidence that Karen came into the picture and started working to help solve this case. I think that that was a beautiful thing. And so for just, you know, that reason alone, I feel like it really began the trajectory to answering some questions for this unsolved case and also in putting it out there for the public to see. But it also created more questions too. Well, for sure. And one of the things that really upset Tracy is that given the contents of the manuscript, she felt a duty to protect Lori. And one of the things that upset her is that the media who she didn't just hand off the manuscript to had looked through some of the pages and without her knowledge, got Lori's contact information, oh. got Lori's name and her con oh. and basically her contact information and reached out to her and Tracy didn't find this out until it aired on TV and she heard at the very end that they had tried to contact the author of the manuscript and Tracy was mortified because she's like oh my gosh like I wasn't trying to put her name out there and right. I was trying to protect this person so she was very upset by that and that's par for the course for media like it's always self-serving there's been times when We've held information that people want to hear, but we don't share it because it's not in the best interest of the case, or it's not in the best interest of the family members, or it's going to cause further pain. But typically, the media doesn't have that same level of reserve. And you have a few different things in play there. So you have the media who's rushing to report something right away, and the most exciting story gets the most coverage. Yeah. And if it sounds crazy, hey, I got a clue, I have this manuscript, and it's going to solve this case. Of course, the media wants to cover it. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. You know, then you have, you know, a true crime community who loves hearing about new cases and loves digging into information. And sometimes we'll put the worst of the worst out there for that shock and awe effect. And so that's just something that you have to be aware about when you're approaching putting a case out there. Yeah. This is years of Tracy's life where she's dealing with this manuscript and she's carrying it with her like luggage. Right. It's got to have been a tremendous emotional journey for her. Definitely. I can imagine the impact of feeling like you have something that's such a huge key to solving a case and closing a case. And then to have this weight that it's not happening, but not just that to think if, this woman is implicating a family member. Did this murder occur in my home? Right. Around my home? 
in yeah. my backyard. Like you start creating this narrative to yourself because you're like, I, there's so many gaps. Like I don't know this full story. And so now you're, is my neighborhood safe? And they just had moved into their house. They hadn't lived in their house very long. So right. I can only imagine the weight that that created for not just Tracy, but her family. Lori begins the narrative of the manuscript by detailing the home as it was when she lived there. The home is about 1,258 square feet. It's a three bedroom, two bathroom, and two car attached garage home that was built in 1951 on about a quarter acre lot. At the time, the house was light green in color with white scallop trim and set along a cul-de-sac, the house smack dab in the middle. Facing the front of their home, the home to the right of their home belonged to the Stuckey family, and the home to the left, the Kesselman family, with the Fowler's residence next to them, and then the Ratzlaff residence, where she claimed her best friend, Barbara, lived. Lori detailed how their home at the time had no fence and no neighbors behind them, which allowed for easy access to the field where all the kids would play. This would be the same field where young Jimmy's body would be found in May of 1964. Lori goes on to say, We would play out in the field, hidden by tall grass and weeds and bright orange poppies. We would pull the weeds up to make bundles and then would use them to build our forts. She spoke of things like her favorite tree in the backyard, baton lessons, her brother, Guy Nelson, liking to play army, and her mother making clothes for one of the neighbor's children. She even shares how, of all the places they lived, that was one of their favorite houses. She also recalled memories from her time in the home that the Ferris family now occupied and recalled a circus that the family had thrown in the summer of 1964, where they charged the neighborhood kids five cents to attend. Strangely, as Karen's investigation dove into the details of the manuscript, none of the people named in the manuscript remembered the Nelson family, not even Barbara Ratzlaff, who Lori purported to be her best friend at the time. Imagine the shock of Barbara seeing photos of herself in the manuscript from a girl she doesn't remember knowing. If that doesn't seem a little out of sorts, she then drops a bombshell in the manuscript written like it was addressed just for Tracy Ferris where she details the story of Jimmy Gall going missing and then subsequently being found not far behind the house in the field. I had to read the manuscript a few times. And when I first read it, I read it as though I'm a detective looking at a case and I'm reading this as, is this implicating somebody? And I don't think that it was truthfully. I think that this is somebody who wrote some memories down for specifically for Tracy about their home. There are a lot of inaccuracies in it, which if you're already being swayed to believe that this could possibly be implicating a family member, it's going to then make you question like, what is your motive? Because there's a lot of inaccuracies in here, you know, like people don't even know who you are, you know, and if you're just writing this for the benefit of somebody having a history of the home, all the inaccuracies are really kind of irrelevant, to be honest. But if indeed this is an implication and you're kind of setting this in somebody's lap, like, hey, I can't do anything about this. Maybe you can, you know, a whole nother ball game. Yeah. Then all the inaccuracies pull everything into question. So if it was a confession or a an accusation, then the accuracy would be critical. What was your interpretation when you read it? Me personally, I feel like she made certain comments in the manuscript that may have alluded, like, for example, where she speaks about a family member knowing more than they should have about the case. Well, what does that mean? How did he get that information? Who shared it with him? Did he learn of that because he knew the intimate details? Or did somebody else share that with him and maybe he knew who did it? It's vague. It's very, very vague. And so... The manuscript really provides more questions than it actually provides answers. It kind of bounces around, which kind of leads to a little bit of the confusion. 
as you're trying to read it, it's almost like she's writing it from a child's perspective. That's the first thing. And then it bounces a little bit around as far as timeline wise. So it kind of confuses you a little bit because of course you don't know her. And so you're reading the story and you're kind of expecting it to go in a chronological order and it doesn't exactly. Right. So that's part of where some of the confusion comes from. And then as you're reading the piece where she speaks about the family member and she's saying, well, they knew information that they shouldn't have known that police basically weren't sharing back then. Well, how would you as a child know that? So this is you with your adult brain years later trying to make sense of something, which is where, again, when you're trying to do something like healing your inner child or you're trying to close some gaps on things that you experienced as a child, going back and visiting that time frame can be helpful. And if that's what she was doing and she was trying to make sense of things, then on top of that, she's mentioning my brother remembered this or my sister remembered this. And, you know, my sister decided to go to the police. Well, why was your sister going to the police? Because the sister was never mentioned. So Guy Nelson, Lori Nelson's brother, is somebody who's mentioned in the paper as being pretty much the last person to see Jimmy alive. The last friend to see Jimmy alive. Right. The last friend to see Jimmy alive. To have that piece of the puzzle and then... To have somebody send you this who's related to him and say, we're doing things to help us recall things that maybe we've forgotten, then also making some implications that the person who you're, which which is her father, is who she's implicating. When you're alluding to the fact that your father is an abusive person in different ways, it kind of starts to build the narrative that could this be the murderer? Right. So are you implicating your father as the murderer? And that's kind of how it can be perceived. So again, I had to read through here several times, which is why I say personally, I think I would have called Lori and been like, hey, Lori, this is a little bit confusing. And I just want to make sure for my own personal sanity, because obviously I'm living in this home now. Now, I don't want to be coming back here years later, like, hey, I'm having some issues. Can you explain this to me? Because it's a little bit confusing. And some of the reasons that make me feel that way is because she gives a lot of personal information. And honestly, if you're going to set something in somebody's lap and give them a murderer, I don't know that you're going to give them all of your personal details. Like she gives a lot of personal details. She gives her siblings full names, her father's full name. She gives her address, her email, her phone number. Like those just aren't things that you typically would, you know, if you're going to drop some information like that to somebody that you would give them so much information about yourself and really open up and be vulnerable. So it's confusing. Yeah. And then also when you start digging into the details and you start to see the misalignment with the comments of people who are saying, well, I don't remember her. And they talk about a circus that nobody in the neighborhood can recall this circus that supposedly everyone came to. And so when you start to see these inaccuracies and and you start to see this misalignment, it really calls everything into question in terms of what is accurate versus what's not accurate. What is memory? What is conjecture? What is part of her fantasy? Because she even talks about fantasizing about having a crush on Jimmy. She talks about that in in the manuscript. Was that real? Or is this how she just remembers it being? Very intriguing. Now, I will say, to Lori's benefit, the manuscript really has been a catalyst for continuing to bubble up this case. Oh, 100%. And it's allowed the mystery of it and what's inside of it, the contents being so mysterious, has really allowed this case to stay alive for more than 60 years. When Karen started looking into this and she started contacting people in the neighborhood and when you start hearing, what family? I didn't know that family. And she makes it seem like, you know, in the manuscript that they lived there for somewhere around two years. And the reality is they maybe lived there for a year. So then when you see comments like, you know, this was one of our favorite houses. Well, something so horrible happened. How is that one of your favorite houses? Or you see, we had this big circus and all the people in the neighborhood came and -and so-and-so took pictures and -and so-and-so, you know, then you're like, and nobody remembers you. Like, this is super weird. You know, so then you're just, you just start questioning, like, what was your motive, you know? And so you're just, you become confused. And so I understand that. Then you start questioning 
not just motives, but like your ability to trust. Like, can I trust this person? You know, this person is is not being fully honest. There's things that are inaccurate. That becomes unsettling. There's also a number of different addresses that she lists. And again, if I was remembering my childhood, I'm trying to even think if I can even remember a address from my childhood when I was that young. Um, and I think I probably can. But if I moved as much as she did, I wouldn't be able to keep track of all those addresses. And so you're talking about somebody as an adult trying to recall memories as a child. And unless you have access to be able to pull all that data up, now you're trying to remember, oh, was it this address or this address? And when did we move? And, you know, plus your perception of time as a child is different too. Yeah. So she makes comments about, you know, we moved in the middle of the night. That also is something that's, you know, seems like, hey, huge red flag. Looks like an implication. Sounds like an implication could be an implication. However, her dad was active duty military and us both haven't been active duty military. We know that nobody's going to move you in the middle of the night. It's just right. not going to happen. Not unless the secret service is involved. <laughs> not going to happen. She also talks about the fact that she was surprised that after the murder of Jimmy Gall, that her family allowed them to walk to school by themselves. But then she also says they were so terrified that they absconded in the middle of the night to move because Guy Nelson's information had been plastered all over the newspapers, his name and his address and where her dad worked. And, and so they were so fearful that they disappeared in the middle of the night, but the kids walked to school. Uh, so again, it's confusing because you're yeah. like, hmm, she's like, I didn't understand that. Like they let us walk to school, but then we moved in the middle of the night and they didn't move in the middle of the night because their circus in the summer would have been after Jimmy's murder, if that indeed took place. Right. So, a couple months after. Right. Yeah. So, so there are some inconsistencies there. And so she mentions, and we're not going to go over this because it's it's personal information and it has nothing to do with the case, but she mentions some personal trauma in the manuscript and personal trauma can have an impact on the human brain that makes recalling information difficult, that can make piecing together information difficult. And actually what happens is a couple things. So your brain can actually have a separation where there's a gap. And so it will fill itself with information it's seen, heard, and the story isn't fully accurate. So part of it's accurate, but that piece that's been filled isn't accurate. Right. Or you can just have a gap there altogether where it's not filled with anything and you're like, hmm, there's a gap. I need to try to fill it. Let me go visit this house. So could she really believe this? 100% she could. Now there's some things in here that, that are off as well, such as there's a photo in the manuscript that has proof written on it. Generally, and there could be a reason for this, but generally when that happens, that's a photo that comes home in a packet for you to say, yes, I'm going to get school pictures. No, I'm not. It's not something that you would have to be able to place into a manuscript as somebody's photo. So that seems odd. And when she puts the photo of the person in there, she doesn't put a photo of herself, which also seems odd. So you're saying, oh, we, we did this together, but then there's no photo of you. You just put a photo of them. The photo that says proof on it is not a photo that you would easily be able to get online because it is not a high school photo. And also because it is a, they were called the bluebirds, kind of like Girl Scouts. That's not a photo that you would be able to pull offline easily. Not unless somebody posted it and said, hey, this was when I was in bluebirds in this year. Maybe, you know, because on classmates, you can post your own photos, personal photos, almost like Facebook. And so if you wanted to say, oh, well, anybody who was in school this year here, you know, whatever, here's my Bluebirds photo, you could do that. I don't think it would be a proof photo. So there's a little question surrounding that. So amongst some of the different inaccuracies and things that don't line up, there's also a couple things that, that do seem quite odd, such as there's mention of, and it aligns with, a story given in the newspaper shortly after Jimmy's murder about Guy Nelson and Jimmy going to meet in order to take some like things that they had collected for some business that had announced, Hey, metal shavings. Yeah. Metal shavings. And so Lori says in there that they had about $60 worth. Could that be a motive? What is that worth today? That would have been worth, back in that time frame, probably about $600, close to $600 is what it would be worth, you know, back in that time. Could that be a motive? Maybe. Maybe that could be a motive if somebody needed that money for rent or car payment or food. You know, there's a number of different things that that could be a potential motive for. 
The other thing that seems a little bit out of sorts as well, and also can be perceived as a little bit creepy. For anybody that's followed any type of serial killer cases, you'll see that a lot of serial killers keep mementos and they do things like create old fashioned scrapbooks, especially back when you didn't have social media and they would have these little books where they would put the photos that they've printed out and um, they would tape them to the page or they would cut out newspaper articles. And so one of the things that's contained in the manuscript is multiple clippings of Jimmy's murder during the time where they were publishing different things and they're cut with decorative shears. Scrapbooking shears. Right. And they're dated. And something that's odd is that his name is underlined in all of these clippings. And now that won't seem odd when I tell you she's a known scrapbooker. She actually authored a book on scrapbooking. Right. So that doesn't seem so odd now, right? Doesn't seem so creepy. Now, could this have been something else? It can kind of be left to the interpretation. Now, she mentioned something in here that doesn't make sense, and that's that the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department actually mailed all of these newspaper articles to her. And you're talking about law enforcement, first of all, is so overwhelmed. Most of them are understaffed, and they have a lot going on. A lot of families of victims cannot even get phone calls back or emails back when they're trying to get case status. The likelihood of them mailing out newspaper articles and the only ones that are on here are ones from the Sacramento Bee. So it, not even all the newspapers because there's much more than what's contained in this manuscript. But that seems odd as well. Although a lot of questions still revolve around the mysterious manuscript, one thing has been certain. It has really served as the catalyst for continuing to shine a light on Jimmy Gall's murder. Karen Lalonde's investigatory journey began with good old-fashioned, old-school investigation. Reminiscent of the early 1980s and 1990s, Karen resorted to sending snail mail letters, visiting the library, and directly contacting the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, anxious for resolution in Jimmy's case. I started putting things together and trying to find kids. I would look at obituaries of some of those people that own those homes, because that way, you could uh, usually find the names of their children. And then I looked at high school yearbooks uh, that came up on Ancestry. So it, it was just a lot of work because you had to figure out how to associate those children with those parents. I mean, it had to be the right age. Sometimes you'd have a common name, but you'd find out, well, that person was, you know, 80 years old at the time. Oh, okay, well, that's not one of their kids. Plus to find married women and sometimes I would um, find mar uh, marriage licenses but I had tremendous luck to be honest with you I sent out many many letters and I really got a good response from a lot of people either called me or emailed me and told me you know what I I grew up in the neighborhood my sister went to school with Jimmy or I played you know down the block from him whatever they contacted me either through the email or phone and you know I asked in the letters for any recollection they had any rumors they had had their parents said anything to them growing up I know law enforcement had always felt that it was somebody in the neighborhood that committed the crime it was very helpful because several of the people told me well this is what we heard about the crime itself or what had happened to Jimmy, or somebody said, well, this person acted suspicious, or somebody said, well, law enforcement questioned this person. So that was really helpful. And in the meantime, then we had Tracy, who was contacting a cold case detective that she heard was associated with that case. And I think she was given that name by, I think it was the uh, interview that she did with the Citrus Heights no, I see either that or the, when she did the TV interview in November of 2022. They furnished her with a name and she made contact with that detective. Then what I was doing while she was doing that was I was sending letters to Sacramento Sheriff. I was trying to get a copy of a homicide report or any additional information they could give me. And of course, I was turned down all the time. She spoke with Dolores, Jimmy's mother, his brother, his sister, and his half-brother, looking for insight and clues as she worked to piece things together. 
However, she was finding that with every string she pulled and began unraveling a truth, another piece of the story frayed, leaving more strings to unravel. The rabbit hole seemed endless, but she tenaciously pursued each with diligence and persistence, piecing together the puzzle, which seemed to grow in size and complexity the more she dug into the case. What she found amazing was how many of the neighborhood children who had known Jimmy or had grown up around him had been so impacted by Jimmy's loss. Friends from grade school, boys in the neighborhood, the girls who remember Jimmy with affection for his kind, sweet nature, multiple people who remember Jimmy as their best friend, and of course Lori, who claims to have had a crush on young Jimmy in her manuscript, were all eager to assist in any way they could. Unfortunately, at some point, the investigation began to slow, and Tracy, having had success with social media, previously in igniting attention around the case, returned to the internet and posted some information about the case online in hopes that bloggers, news outlets, podcasters, and etc. would choose to invest time in Jimmy's case. As true crime podcasters, we often have families reach out with the hopes that we might take on their family member's crime, tell their story, share details about the crime, and ignite attention in cases, especially when they have remained unsolved or have gone cold. This is often a family's last resort, once detectives have stopped answering their calls and the case falls from the headlines. Not every podcast is the same. Many podcasters regurgitate known cases, share details that are easy to find, and do a better job of highlighting the perpetrator, often forgetting about the victims and the lives they led before a tragedy occurred. These podcasts have their purpose, they do. When we learned of Jimmy Gall's case, we quickly realized that there was not much information available about the case, and taking the case on would require a substantial investment of time and investigatory effort. It was an unsolved crime that was almost 60 years old and by definition, a cold case. Our initial efforts were to align our investigation with Karen Lalonde, who had been leading the investigation up to that point, and work to develop a collaborative strategy to move the investigation forward. We established a timeline and went over all the evidence and supporting documents that Karen had already secured in order to avoid duplication of effort. What she had collected was beyond impressive. Her over 2,000 hours of investigatory work had been extremely fruitful. Karen quickly got us up to speed on where she was in the investigation, who she had already spoken to, who she couldn't, etc. We then began to pull data where there were gaps and constructed a 1964 neighborhood map starting with Jimmy's home. We pinpointed where his body was discovered and worked our way outward. We then scoured all of our databases to pull in everything we could find on the case and work to combine that data so that we were all aligned. From there, we began working the case like it had just occurred, in present time from square one. We began to build on where we were, with the initial breakthrough centered around removing biases in the beginning and starting fresh with a new set of eyes. Quickly, we began to uncover very distinctive details. We began developing leads that aligned very closely with the detective work that had occurred in 1964. And as our communication increased to daily calls, we began to unravel many of the mysteries surrounding this case. Obviously, one of the things that became very important to us and Karen is to figure out if this manuscript really had any truth to it, really, as far as implicating anybody. The police cannot receive something as a tip and just discount it. So knowing this, I knew that they had to have contacted the Nelsons and My next step with, you know, if the police weren't going to release any information was I wanted to reach out to the Nelson family. I reached out to a lot of the Nelson family and none of them have responded yet. I would like to hope that after this airs that the Nelson family would be open to speaking to us and not even that it needs to be on a podcast, but kind of clearing some of this stuff up for just the importance of the investigation, truthfully. But I would be inclined to believe that whatever was shared with the sheriff's department more than likely was resolved in their interviews with the Nelsons. And so where does that bring us as far as the Nelsons are concerned? Well, let's look at this from the outside looking in. 
there's a couple things that I find to be a little bit sad. One is that the writer of the manuscript, so her father recently passed away, and in his obituary, her and her children are not listed. Seems odd, right? Could all of this have created discord in their family? Absolutely. And so imagine on their end, if somebody went to the police and made the police believe that, you know, that your father was a murderer and that's how they reached out to your family, how that impacted your family, especially if it wasn't true, pretty significant. And then imagine thinking for 20 years that that was done. Now you've lost your father and it comes up again probably not the best situation in your family and your family who is probably upset about the initial calls from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department they're probably not open to speaking to anybody so it doesn't surprise me that years later that they kind of ghosted everybody that doesn't surprise me self-preservation you know from the sounds of it from Lori's explanation in the manuscript I think they've done everything that they thought they could do in order to shed light on what happened and if this manuscript caused some division within their family, then this might be something that's painful to address and painful to engage in. And so this may not be a conversation that they want to have, and that's okay. It's their right to not have this conversation and not to be contacted, you know what I'm saying, and not to be harassed and whatnot. And obviously, we're just looking for some clarity in the document and trying to understand it so that we can help move the case forward. To your point of what you said, like if this caused a rift, then this may be a pain point within that family that that they don't want to engage on this. They don't want to talk about this. And I will say that we did our due diligence, along with Karen as well, to look into that implication and to look into her father, because that is who, if there is an implication, that's who it would have been. And with this type of crime, you're going to see something, rather it before that time frame, after that time frame. And what you mean by that is that if he were the murderer, then more than likely there would be evidence of that in other actions that he had taken in the past, before and after Jimmy's death. Right. And we just didn't see that, truthfully. And what you guys were looking for were, were patterns of, of crime similar to what happened to Jimmy. Even if it wasn't quite at that level, even something, you know, was he a sex offender? Did he have, you know, was he kicked out of the military? Did he have any type of records in the military of, of abuse? Did he, right. you know, all of those different kinds of things. And there just is nothing there. And not to mention that. So there are a lot of families that do a very good job of keeping things under wraps for years and years and years. Some sure forever, you know, one of the things though, that is very telling is people from the outside. Like it's really hard for you, especially when you've moved around a lot and you've been exposed to a lot of people for something not to come out somewhere, like for something to not bleed out somewhere. And there isn't anything like that out there. There just isn't. And even after he passed away, the things that people say about him are extremely positive. People that he mentored, people that he worked with, people that he was friends with, people who had kids who he coached. Nothing, like nothing negative at all. Not even a comment about, you know, he was a womanizer. He was a nothing like that. And we've seen that with other persons of interest. So, and in other cases, because to be honest, most people have a skeleton in their closet and something will come up somewhere. That just wasn't the case with this person. And what's unfortunate about it is that this could all very well have been a huge misunderstanding. And it's unfortunate because I don't think that Tracy's intention was to smear a family. And I don't think Tracy's intention was to hurt a family or have a family experience another level of trauma that she had no idea that she was creating. And same on Lori's end. I don't think Lori intended to create a situation where she caused a family any type of trauma. I think that Lori was trying to work through something that this is my my thought. I think Lori was trying to work through something and I think she'd shared some personal things 
in her process of trying to understand some things and work through some things. And, you know, and I think that Guy has some trauma, just like a lot of these other members of the community have had over Jimmy's death. And it's unfortunate because I would love for the Nelsons to be a part of closing this case. And I would love for the Nelsons to be part of helping Dolores, Jimmy's mother, to experience some type of closure. I would love to speak to them. Obviously, even if it's not, you know, there's no requirement for them to do a podcast. I I just would love to hear from them, truthfully. The manuscript written by Lori Nelson has served as a catalyst for Jimmy's case, propelling it twice from obscurity back into the attention of the mainstream. With Tracy Ferris's focus on pursuing answers, she has kept many of the contents of the manuscript secret over the years to protect both the writer and the case, while moving the case forward, albeit sometimes in small, incremental steps, still forward progress. No one has been able to confirm Lori's accounts of her childhood. The thing that amazed Tracy and I the most was that nobody in that neighborhood and the surrounding block knew the person that authored a manuscript. No one has been able to validate or gain clarity as to whether there is an implication of a suspect or person of interest in the manuscript. Although she alludes to her father knowing more than he should have known about the crime, we do not know if she thought her father capable of murdering a seven-year-old boy. Although she speaks of abuse and having fear of her father, there is no evidence that he was abusive or capable of such a tragedy. As we close the chapter of the manuscript and begin to transition to the most likely persons of interest, we are forced to close the chapter on the mysterious manuscript with unanswered questions. Was the manuscript a nostalgic glimpse into a childhood morphed into a complex narrative of trauma and potential false memories born within episodes of trauma and abuse? With each revelation, the distinction between reality and imagination became increasingly blurred, leaving us to grapple with the unsettling notion that what could have been perceived as an implication of a family member's guilt may have just been the history of a family and their old house. Join us next week for the exciting continuation, Who Murdered Jimmy Gall? Finding Jimmy, Who is Vandegrift? In our pursuit of justice and closure, we'll dive into the life of who some perceived as a primary person of interest in Jimmy's case. A World War II veteran, a high school math teacher, a tutor of Jimmy's mother, Dolores, and a father. Melford Burrow Vandegrift discovered seven-year-old Jimmy in the early morning hours of Sunday, May 3rd, 1964. This next episode will pull on the strings of the fabric of justice in this case, and it's not all what you would expect. You will hear from not one, but two members of the Vandegrift family. And that's not all. You will hear a piece of Jimmy's story that has never been heard. This will confront lingering questions, untangle some mysteries, and bring us one step closer in our quest for truth and justice. And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate and contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime Podcast. Podcast. Bye.